Hello everyone, my name is Clantus and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's get into today's case and it is the case of Hannah Cornelius, the tragic murder of a true sweetheart. So Hannah Cornelius was born on the 13th of February 1996 in Cape Town, South Africa. Hannah Cornelius was described as a kind-hearted, confident girl who never wanted to see people struggle in life. People that knew Hannah Cornelius say that she was a considerate girl. She always made people laugh, smile, and made them feel good about themselves. And this is coming from both old and young. Her classmates as well as her peers described her as very intelligent and active in sports and other extracurriculums in high school. She even volunteered at an animal shelter in Cape Town because she was a lover of animals. The way Hannah Cornelius was such a sweetheart on her 16th birthday when she and her mother went to India for, to celebrate her birthday, her mother asked her, what do you want me to get for you for your 16th birthday? And Hannah responded to her by saying, how can I spend money on myself when so many people are living in poverty all around South Africa? So no, I don't want anything for my 16th birthday. All I want is for people to live a better life. This became who Anna was. Considerate, kind, confident, intelligent, and always worried about the next person's comfort. Considering that Hannah Cornelius comes from a wealthy family where her father is a magistrate and her mother a very successful lawyer in Cape Town. Both Hannah and her brother went to private schools in Cape Town. When Hannah graduated from high school, she walked away with six distinctions. Hannah Cornelius had great plans for her life, so much so that she decided to go and apply at the University of Stellenbosch, where she studied a degree in humanities. She did not follow in the footsteps of her parents in law. So if you have never seen Stellenbosch University before, well, salivate, my friend, because it is one of the most beautiful campuses in South Africa. It is situated in a small town called Stellenbosch, just outside of Cape Town. It is also in the middle of vineyards as well as winemaking, because Stellenbosch is South Africa's winemaking paradise. Stellenbosch is also famous for the party scenes simply because it is also a university town. So all the students that go to Stellenbosch University, this is where they party. This is where they basically created a reputation. They are very good students. If you think of if you think of Harvard, then you'll be thinking of Stellenbosch because they have the same Ivy League kind of feel. However, Stellenbosch University is like South Africa's Harvard. So as you know, wherever there is a party scene among students, there is also going to be alcohol in the mix. And the Stellenbosch University students were no exception to the rule. Because in Stellenbosch, they have a lot of nightclubs as well as bars and hangout spots where students go and unwind after a long week of academics. So on the 26th of May 2017, Hannah Cornelius and a male friend by the name of Chaselyn Marsh decided to go out that night. They had had a long week of academics, so they just wanted to go unwind and have some little bit of fun before they came back and start attacking their books once more. However, Chaselyn Marsh was also a skater boy. So he decided that he was going to go to his boy's residence, which I'm going to be referring as a rest in this video. So in South Africa, just like anywhere else in the world, you have university and the university students, they live in residence, which we call here in South Africa, rest. Some universities, they will have only boys rest and other universities will have only girls rest. So in this case, Chaselyn Marsh lives in a boy's rest. So he went to his boy's rest to his room or dormitory and fetch his skateboard so that he can go with it to the club with Hannah. So while Chaselyn was going to prepare himself at the boys' rest, Hannah went and fetched a blue and white city golf. Hannah's blue and white city golf was gifted to her by her grandmother. 
So when the time came for Chaseline and Hannah to go to the club, she went and picked him up and then they drove straight to the nightclub, which was not too far off the campus. So at the nightclub, Chaseline and Hannah had a great time with the other students and their circle of friends. Basically, they were doing what students do in nightclubs, just having fun, dancing, listening to music, and conversing about probably the subject or a certain professor that did or said something that was funny or they did not understand. You know what I'm talking about. We all been there. So nightclubs in South Africa, they must be closed by 3 a.m. Otherwise, they will be breaking the law. And I think everybody that is coming from the club is given about 30 to 45 minutes to get to their homes. Otherwise, they will be charged with loitering. So by 3 a.m., Chaseline and Hannah had had enough and Chaseline wanted to go back to his rest because he was feeling rather tired and he also had a little bit to drink. So he just wanted to lay his body on his bed so that he can start preparing to study the following day. So Chaseline went around to greet his friends as well as other classmates that were at the nightclub to say, hey guys, good night. I will see you on Monday in class or wherever or whenever they are going to meet again. So Hannah realized that Cheslin was about to leave. She went after him and said, hey, how are you going back home? And then Chaseline said, I'm going to be using my skateboard to skate across town to my place. That is when Hannah was like, no, no, no. I don't want you to be skating across town all by yourself. This time of the night, it is quite dangerous. So let me take you home. Of course, Chaseline was like, okay, free ride and I'll be safe. So he took her offer and off they went. So when they got to Chaseline's apartment or rest, Chaseline and Hannah decided to just chill a little bit and continue having a conversation probably about what happened in the nightclub or probably the fun they had. Goodness knows what the conversation was about, but because Hannah is a kind-hearted girl and very much a sweetheart, she wanted to make sure that Chaseline was well taken care of before she went back to her own rest. So while they were parked in front of Chaseline's apartment, Hannah decided to wind the window just a little bit down so that fresh air could get in the car. So while they were busy having a conversation, out of the blue, a man stuck his finger with a screwdriver and stuck it on Hannah's chest and told her to shut up. While Hannah was shocked and frozen with fear, on the passenger side, another man appeared and basically started manhandling Chaseline and said, you make one move, the girl dies. So these two men proceeded to rob Chaseline and Hannah. So just as Chaseline and Hannah thought that the ordeal was over, that is when these two men started calling two other men to come into the car. Now in the car, there are six people. That is Hannah, Chaseline, and these four men who had robbed them. So one of the robbers' name was Nashville Julius, who realized that, you know what, I'm uncomfortable with the situation right now. All of us crammed up in one car. So he decided, you know what, he made a run for it. He left them right there. And now there were five people left in that car. So the robber that held a screwdriver against Hannah's chest demanded that she get out of the car and go to the back and be sandwiched between two of the guys. And then they demanded that Chaseline remains in the passenger seat in front. So the robber that had a screwdriver on Hannah's chest then decided to take the wheel and drove off with Hannah and Chaseline. So as these robbers were driving around with Chaseline and Hannah, they told Hannah that, listen, we don't want your car. All we want is to get ourselves where we can buy some drugs. After that, we will release you guys unharmed. Eventually, after driving what felt like a lifetime, the robber then stopped the car at Hay Scooter's Pass. Now, the reason why they stopped the car in Hay Scooter Pass is because they wanted to make a decision what they were going to do with Hannah and Chaseline. And they also wanted to make sure that they have taken every valuable possession that they had on them. So they began to pat them to look for more valuable items. And that is when they came across Chaseline's wallet. 
When they opened the wallet, they saw that there was no money. However, they saw a bank card. And that is when one of the robbers, his name was Vernon Vitboy, asked for his PIN number for his bank card. And that is when Chaseland was like, even if I do give you the PIN number, I don't have any money in my bank account. I am a struggling student. But Vernon Vitboy did not want to hear that. Instead, it was making him upset. That is when they took Hannah and Chaseland back in the car. But this time, the screwdriver robber opened the boot of Hannah's car and threw Chaseland in there. And then they drove off. And once again, they started driving around Stellenbosch all the way to a gas station. But before they got to the gas station, they decided that Hannah should take the front seat so that it does not look suspicious that a white girl is seated in between two black men in the dark. But if she's sitting in front, nobody's going to suspect anything. At this particular point in time, Hannah herself was not saying anything. I am supposing the reason why she's quiet and not looking at these criminals in the eye is because of the training she might have received home. I'm one of the people that was taught that if I get mugged or robbed, never look at the criminals in the eye. Basically, just surrender yourself and let them take whatever they need to take. Even if they try to talk to you, try not to say anything at all. That way, they will not panic and they will not also think that you already saw their faces and you can recognize them. And that is going to save your life. So I'm supposing that's exactly what Hannah Cornelius was taught at home how to avoid getting in trouble with robbers should she ever find herself in that situation. And I can tell you it's a horrible situation because I've been in it multiple times before. So they proceeded to drive to the gas station and they stopped at the gas station. Vernon Vitboy then got out of the car and went into the gas station shop where there was an ATM. He basically took Chaseland's bank card and went to try and withdraw some money. So Vernon then stuck the card in the ATM and punched in the pin code that Chaseland had given him. And the ATM responded by saying insufficient funds but that made Vernon extremely angry. He went back to the car, basically fuming at Chaseland. He then turned and looked at Hannah and said, this boy is going to pay one way or the other. So they then drove off from the gas station where they drove around like headless chickens. Now, one of the reasons why they kept driving around was because they now wanted to buy crack cocaine and there was nobody around to sell them this crack cocaine. However, there was somebody who was willing to sell them a drug called Mandrax. So after buying the Mandrax, that is when they drove to a house near Greifontein where they smoked this Mandrax and when they were done smoking the Mandrax, they once again turned on Hannah and said to her, that boy is going to die. So once again, they found themselves just driving around. Now this time, they drove just outside of Stellenbosch and they came to an abandoned field where they stopped the car and then they went to the back of the car boot and opened it and dragged Chaseland out. Once again, Hannah was quiet throughout this ordeal. However, the only time that Hannah said something was when she was begging these three men for Chaseland's life, begging them to please stop, don't hurt him. And she was just asking them, please don't hurt him, don't hurt him. But these men, they proceeded to drag Chaseland and then they started beating him up, beat him to a pulp to a point where he passed out. When, when Chaseland passed out, they thought they had killed him. And that is when they went back in the car with Hannah just devastated and distraught at witnessing her friend being murdered like that. In the car, the three men said, we told you that your friend is going to die for lying to us about his bank card. Now, what I'm failing to understand is, so I'm sure most of us went to an ATM before knowing fully well that we may not have funds in there, but took a chance anyway. And then we stuck our card in the ATM and then we punch in the pin number and then the screen just comes back and saying insufficient funds. Now, what I'm trying to understand is 
how did they come to the conclusion that when the machine said insufficient funds meant that Chaseland lied to them? Oh, I remember, they're idiots. So once again, they dragged Hannah and they drove off to a paintball field where they dragged Hannah out of the car and then they took her to an open field where they just laid her face up. And after that, they started handing each other condoms. You can just imagine what happened to Hannah after that. After they were done doing what they had done to Hannah, they then discarded the condoms not far from where they raped Hannah. And once again, they dragged her into her own car and they started driving around once again. I'm just trying to imagine what Hannah must have been going through. I don't get it. I, I just, I just don't get it. When I was researching this case, I got so angry. I remember the last time I was this angry when I was researching a case was that of Palisa Madiba. I feel the same anger with this case as I felt with Palisa Madiba's murder. Both these cases persuaded me to actually start looking at the death penalty and thinking these men deserve to die by hanging. A slow, painful death for what they do to innocent people. So when they drag Hannah into her own car, this time they threw her in the boot of her car and then they drove 20 kilometers outside of Stellenbosch. When they stopped by the side of the road near a vineyard, they went to the boot of the car and tried to force Hannah out of the car, but Hannah was very hesitant because she did not know what these men were going to do to her this time. That is when one of the robbers stabbed Hannah in the neck and then she held her neck trying to stop the bleeding because she was bleeding profusely and that is when they dragged her out of the car into the open felt and the other two men started looking for something that they were going to use to kill her because at this point in time they were panicking while they were seeing blood profusely coming out of hannah's neck eventually two of the men came across a boulder they picked it they lifted this boulder two men lifting a boulder and then they came and dropped it on hannah's head twice unfortunately hannah succumbed to her head injuries can you imagine what these idiots did they left the boulder on top of her head as they drove off this persuades me about the death penalty that it's actually a good thing so Hannah and Chaseland were robbed and kidnapped around 3 a.m. on the 27th of May 2017 and then they were killed around 5 a.m. on the 27th of May 2017. So after killing Hannah, the three men then drove to a town called Cryfontaine where they met a woman that was walking along the road to work. They started hailing all kinds of insults at her, calling her every negative term you can imagine on a woman. This woman was so startled and very afraid to a point where she slipped and fell. When she slipped and fell, they stopped the car and they got out the car and then they stole her bag and they drove off. So while they were driving, basically running away from robbing this poor lady that they started attacking, they met another woman in Cryfontein, and then they, once again, they started hailing insults at her, calling her every name in the book. The same, once again, this woman as well was quite afraid, but this time they stopped the car, then they went and grabbed this woman, screaming and kicking into the car, and they drove off with her. These three idiots drove to a gas station where Vernon Vidboy got out of the car and went to an ATM in the gas station to withdraw money from this lady's account that they just kidnapped. Now because there was a long line to the, a to the ATM machine, Vernon was taking some time to withdraw and get back to the car. So one of the two men that remained in the car went out of the car to go and check what is holding Vernon up. And this idiot's name was Ibn Faniker. 
So indeed, Vernon was still in the shop waiting his turn to withdraw money out of the ATM machine. Indeed, they managed to withdraw 3,000 rand of this poor lady's money. And then they went back into the car and drove off. They went back to Cryfontein and dropped her where they basically kidnapped her from and they proceeded with her 3,000 rand. So as they were driving towards Stellenbosch, that is when Eben was like, okay guys, you can drop me here, I can go home. They gave this stupid Eben guy 1,000 rand, I'm supposing, as his salary for the stupidity that they have done. So while they dropped off the fellow idiot, Chaseland had survived the attack. He was found by a couple walking by and they rescued him, called the ambulance and he was taken away to the nearby hospital where the police questioned him about what had happened to him. That is when Chaseland told the police about the four men that had robbed them and these men have his friend Hannah Cornelius. Then the police published an APB and a bolo on the blue and white city golf. In case you didn't know what a bolo is, is be on the lookout. So while the police were busy radioing all the other police in that radius in Stellenbosch, one of the undercover police was listening to the police radio while he was sitting in his vehicle when a blue and white city golf passed him. And that is when he called for backup and started following this blue and white city golf. Not long after that, a police van followed suit and they were following this blue and white city golf. And in the city golf, it was indeed two of the three murderers. That was Geraldo Parsons and Vernon Vidboy. When both these murderers realized that they were being followed by the police, that is when they started a high-speed chase all over the streets of Stellenbosch. Eventually, the two idiots drove into a suburb that was filled with boom gates. When they had nowhere to run, they got out of the car and started running on foot. But the two idiots were too lazy to run. The undercover cop, his name was Detective Bulelani Diko, chased after these two idiots and caught up with them and placed them under arrest. Vernon and Geraldo were taken in two different cars and they were also placed in two different cells so that one does not influence the other about what story to tell the police. So when the two idiots, when they were being questioned by the police, they wasted no time and started rattling each other out because one did not trust the other one that they were not rattling them out. So much honor in criminals, right? So one of the criminals, I think it was Geraldo, told the police that they would find Hannah's, where to find Hannah's body and where they raped Hannah and also told the police about the two women that they had robbed. While Vernon was also trying to pin everything on, on Geraldo about the killing and raping of Hannah Cornelius. So the police indeed went to the crime scenes. They collected the three condoms and then they collected Hannah Cornelius' body. And of course the police told the two murderers that one of the victims, Chaslin Marsh, survived the attack. Of course the two murderers were quite surprised that he had survived that attack. So the police also found out during the interrogation that there were two other men that were involved in the killing of Hannah Cornelius. They mentioned Eben van Niekerk's name as well as Nashville Julius's name. And the police went and picked them up also and placed them under arrest. Of course, Nashville Julius was quite surprised to see the police at his door. One thing he knew for sure was that he was involved in the initial stages when they robbed Hannah and Chaseland. So he thought that he was being picked up for that. When he heard that murder, kidnapping, and all the other major charges were placed on his head, that is when he was like, no, 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 no. I know nothing about the murder of anybody. All I was involved in was the robbery. That is it. And then I ran away after that. So the police, just to make sure that the stories were straight and forward, both Vernon as well as Geraldo started playing dumb, thinking that the police may not have necessarily caught everything that they had confessed. So they were thinking, okay, maybe they still have a chance at freedom. They started playing dumb. 
but the police had already collected all the important evidence and the evidence was overwhelming it was almost like a slam dunk case three major evidence that made the police extremely happy during the investigations it was the cctv camera footage of chaseland's apartment as well as the three condoms which had dna of the three rapists as well as hannah's dead body so these were the charges that were laid on the four men they were charged with murder rape attempted murder kidnapping and robbery however nashville cornelius was only charged with robbery and kidnapping because the police had found out that he was not involved in the rape as well as the murder of hannah cornelius Indeed, he was telling the police the truth that he was only involved at the beginning of this entire ordeal. But after that, he did run away. And the CCTV footage does show that Nashville Julius did walk away. Chaseland Marsh was so traumatized and distraught by the entire ordeal that had happened to him. One of the things that had happened to Chaseland, he lost hearing in one ear. And he also dropped out of university because he couldn't cope with all the post-traumatic stress disorder he was experiencing. The Cornelius family, they also were going through hell at the loss of their daughter. I can just only imagine to find out that the kind-hearted girl was brutally murdered by three morons who had absolutely no business in being in the student town i also understand that hannah's mother a year after the death of hannah she too passed away from drowning Hannah's father then hung up his robe as a magistrate and became a full-time father to his son. Vernon, Geraldo, and Eben were found guilty and they were sentenced to life imprisonment. And this is mandatory life imprisonment. On top of the life sentences, they were also given 100 years each. Again, how I wish the death penalty was still around because these three oxygen stealers would have been hanged. So that is it with Hannah Cornelius' case, the tragic murder of a true sweetheart. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and also subscribe to my channel if you are not subscribed yet. And please click the bell notification so that you get notified every time I upload a new true crime video. And I will also highly appreciate it if you left me a comment down below and let me know what you think of this case and what you also think about the death penalty. Please share this video far and wide, especially to other true crime enthusiasts. Thank you for watching today and I will see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.